everyone. I am Rachel Horn, Head of Marketing and Communications at Filecoin Foundation. I am thrilled to be here today with this stellar lineup of interstellar uh, panelists here with me, introducing Marta Belcher, President of Filecoin Foundation, Sarah Sabri with the Deep Space Initiative, and Tim Shepard with Lockheed Martin Space. And today we're going to be talking about the future of communications in space, how decentralized technologies fit into that picture, and where we're headed with uh, truly bringing Web3 into the, out, into the outer, outer layers. So first I want to start off, we have an announcement today, Marta. Talk to us about what's going on at Filecoin Foundation and what we're doing with space today. We do. Uh, I am so excited to be back in Davos on this stage. This is actually my third time on the stage talking about the project that we've been working on uh, with uh, the, the help of the amazing Lockheed Martin team uh, to put IPFS, which is the interplanetary file system, into space. Um, and so IPFS uh, actually was called the interplanetary file system um, because we've always seen it as a way to improve networking in space, to improve long distance communications, um, make them more efficient. Um, and so a couple years ago, we announced that we were going to be uh, working together on this, uh, on this initiative. Uh, we announced the details of that last year and we are thrilled to announce today that we were actually able uh, to do a demonstration mission in which we used IPFS to send data back and forth from Earth to space. Pretty cool. Yeah. Um, I want to tell me a little bit more about that. Like, what did it look like? How did it work? Who was in the room? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so it was very exciting. It was a, it was a very exciting uh, uh, to be sort of uh, via video uh, on the sort of looking, uh, having a demonstration mission where we could actually see data going back and forth. Um, the things that we sent back and forth were the IPFS white paper. Um, and then you may have seen around the sanctuary uh, our uh, mascot, which is uh, Biscuit the File Corgi. And we sent a little picture of our corgi back and forth uh, from Earth to an orbiting Lockheed Martin satellite. Um, we're really excited to do that because it really demonstrates the ways that IPFS can really make space communications better. Um, and this was really uh, the culmination of multiple years of creating an implementation of IPFS that will actually work in space. Um, and this was really us showing that this, this product be, that we have worked on for multiple years actually does work in space. That's great. Tim, I want to bring you into the conversation here because, of course, none of this would have happened without uh, the excellent uh, technical support from the Lockheed Martin Space Team. So first, tell us about sort of the tech. I'd love to know first, what is Lockheed Martin doing in space? I don't think a lot of people think of Lockheed Martin as a space company. Yeah, so that might sound surprising to some. And yet, yesterday, I had the uh, opportunity to be here at the Filecoin reception. And there are a number of new space companies that were listed here. And I would say half of them um, asked the earnest question, so what is Lockheed's interest in space? And I thought to myself, oh, right, I'm at Davos. <laughs> and in this context, I'm usually at some type of air show, and everybody knows what Lockheed Martin's doing there. And of course, in this context, there was an earnest question. So it, it started my mind rolling just to say, why don't we just quickly have a quick discussion about what the heck is actually going on there and why we're on this stage. The first instance here is, the whole interaction with space, I mean, it's a relatively young human experience, it's relatively speaking, in a single lifetime that we're just talking about. Um, I don't know how interactive this can be with the audience, but I would say amongst my friends and peers here, you know, if we think about what was the first interaction, humans and space, breaking the common line, which is really that moment between atmosphere uh, and exo-atmosphere, do you guys have an opinion when it was like the first interaction that our species had like that? Right. So actually, it was uh, in June 1944. Ah. It was the V2 rocket, right? That was something of a parabolic arch. But that was the first moment that a human machine actually exited the gravity well, although it came back, right? Um, the next instance, of course, where you get interaction with what happens for a, a manufactured system that is leaving Earth's orbit and doing something out there, of course, generally accepted as Sputnik. So that takes place in October 1957. But it turns out, in my research for this just last night, because I wanted to tell people what was going on, it turns out there's a non-zero chance that the United States actually put something into orbit, man-made, uh, several months before. So it turns out that there was an underground nuclear test about 300 meters down, there was, a, there was a manhole cover 
about uh, 30 meters across that was capping this thing. And after the test went off, they couldn't find the manhole cover. And as much as they tried to look for it, they couldn't find it. So they went back to the high-speed film. And they figured out, by looking at the film, they had one frame, which means the manhole cover was traveling at six times uh, the velocity to escape Earth's gravity. Wow. Hmm. So it turns out, by accident, it was more than likely the United States actually put us into orbit somewhat unintentionally, but there's a context here, and it sounds like I'm gonna to torture this metaphor. What happens after that? Lockheed and a lot of other countries, of course, get into the space race. There is a direct analogy. It, by accident, right, we find ourselves in a business that has a lot to do with communications, right? The uh, US domestic product is something like $26 trillion last year, and I think the uh, space-related economy was something on the order of, say, 300 billion. But the reality is it's a $2 trillion impact to our economy. If you had something to interrupt our space infrastructure, that might be something from solar flares or some type of conflict. And therefore, I bring it back. Lockheed Martin is involved primarily in space construct um, from building satellites that are both uh, national security as well as commercial, heavy emphasis on national security space. However, we're starting to embrace, of course, what's happening with the evolution of the space economy. And in this case, the distributed architecture for ledger systems is something that we had the opportunity to use a satellite and for the first time really demonstrate with a commercial partner that we could change the code from the ground and reprogram that satellite. That's very important to us. On the one hand, you might think about it, it's an app-based satellite. So our smart sats become, in effect, like an iPhone or a smartphone that goes to space, and you can alter its code and what it does. That's a critical inference, because while we might be participating specifically what's happening in a space-based economy, and what happens with Filecoin, a fantastic partner, it also speaks to the nature of distributed uh, aperture, if you will, of uh, cooperative systems, and it puts us actually into, from the defense and security side, a whole new world focused on the human-machine interface, man, woman, on the loop, and ultimately a new interaction with our systems that become hybrid hive organisms, and that is something actually that this opportunity opened up to us. I have to thank uh, Joe Landon, I don't know if he's here today, but the context for us to be able to get into this to find new partners to experiment uh, is really the basis of innovation, and therefore it's a great honor to be here today. That's great. All right, so your bona fides. That was great to know a little bit about how the history of Lockheed Martin in this space and now what you're looking at going forward. Um, Sarah, I'd like to bring you into the conversation here. Um, in addition to uh, heading up Deep Space Initiative, Sarah is also an astronaut, so you are the first woman in Africa to enter or outer space, out, enter the Earth's orbit. And I want to hear more from you about sort of what you're working on at Deep Space Initiative, how you're thinking about decentralized tools in your work, and also just, I want to hear about your experience in space, mm -hmm. too. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, when we're talking about space, we're always thinking about, we're always thinking that it's so limitless, right? But the truth is, in terms of opportunities in the real world and on Earth, that it's really not that way. It's very much limited. It really depends on where you're from, on your resources, on your passports. And for me, when I started working in the field, I realized that that was the case for a lot of people all over the world. And that even if you want to do research, you can collaborate with people from all over the world, but you can't have access to the data. And even if you're very qualified to a specific position, let's say at NASA or SpaceX or wherever, you just cannot even apply because of where you're from. And I started talking to a lot of people, and people from NASA and my partner in the Space Initiative, um, her name is Dr. Jennifer Fogarty. She was at NASA chief scientist for 15 years, and she really believed also in the fact that we need to be making space more accessible. And that's why I founded this Deep Space Initiative, where our whole mission revolves around increasing access to the field. And we do that by providing opportunities in research, education, and also working on the legal side as well. We're not yet a lobbying entity, but we are trying to educate, so we're doing research on that aspect as well. And that also helps with international collaboration, because we all face the same problems in the engineering field, mm -hmm. but then when you have countries that are working on a specific problem, they have reached a specific point, but then you can have another country or another agency or another company that has, you know, can fill that gap that they're missing, but they just cannot communicate. 
So you have a lot of laws that exist that stop international collaboration. We've seen a lot of projects actually stop because of that. So that's something that I'm also trying to work on as well. And so that's the Youth Space Initiative as a whole. And we have projects from all over. We have about 30 something nationalities that we've been able to reach and they've been able to work on research hands on and, and really be able to impact the field and where otherwise they would not have had that opportunity because people would be looking at their passports rather than their qualifications and their CVs. So that's something that we've been able to do. We've been um, very fortunate to have now published many papers that in topics that range from astronaut health and performance, space architecture, space transportation systems. We have courses, we have a lot of really, really exciting things. And I've got, like I've had people come up to me like recently even, uh, I was at a conference one day and they, then they would tell me that they were able to apply to PhD positions or jobs in the field because of the opportunity that they got where it gave them just like that belief, just like that first step where you know, you just sometimes you just need that one little step forward in order to be able to open the doors because you have it inside of you. So you don't really need to be empowered. It's not like you need um, someone to help you with it. You just need someone to like look past where you're from rather than, you know, that be the first judgment. And it's not the fault of the companies per se. It's not the fault of the, the CEOs. It's the laws that have existed for many, many decades that made ha might have made sense back then, but maybe they don't make sense anymore. And just like when we're looking at the new banking systems, when we're looking at Web3 and decentralized technologies now, we are again and again realizing that Things need to belong to the people a little bit more. We need to have a say in those laws. We have to need to, we need to, we need a seat at that table. And we need to all have a seat at that table. And it can't just be one entity or one person. So it's the same idea here in the space field where that's what we need yeah. to be doing. Um, a lot of these ideas we talk about every day at Filecoin Foundation. And even what you're talking about, about um, sourcing people and sourcing ideas from around the world. We're a fully distributed company around the world. And one of the benefits of that is you're not hiring in a specific place. I mean, COVID really sort of shifted that model for people. You can find the best ideas, the brightest minds from all over. So it's great to see how you're bringing that into space. Um, talking a little bit more about the mission that, that we just completed, I think it might be helpful to explain why the internet model that we use today just doesn't translate to space. So Marta, maybe you can go into that a little bit more. Absolutely. So today's internet model, the way that it works is data is stored in a particular server in a particular place. So when you're online and you're clicking around and you're seeing data appear on your screen, that is actually getting retrieved from a server in a particular place somewhere. Now that's fine when you're on Earth. There isn't a huge delay. But if you're on the moon and the data you're trying to access is on Earth, there's gonna be a multi-second delay. If you're out by Mars, there's gonna be a multi-minute delay, right? So to have, uh, to have a, a sort of network where every single time you're retrieving data, you're retrieving it from a particular location, like today's centralized internet model, it actually just doesn't work in space. It, in, it introduces a lot of latency. Um, what we do with IPFS, um, IPFS was actually called the interplanetary file system from the beginning because it was always envisioned as a way to make networking in space more efficient. Um, the way that IPFS works is that information isn't retrieved based on a location but rather based on what it is. So each piece of data actually has a content ID. Uh, when you look for that data, you're not looking for it in a particular place. Instead, what you're doing is looking for that data by its content ID, and it'll pull it from wherever's closest. So if you already have that data because you already downloaded it, you'll pull it from your device. If there's a nearby lunar station that has it, you'll pull it from there. If there's an orbiting satellite that has it, you'll get it from there. So you can get data in a much more efficient way. Um, and so that really helps to reduce the latency uh, of communications in space. It has a couple of other benefits as well. Um, the second important benefit is one of the challenges with storing data in space um, is it often gets corrupted because of the radiation. Um, similarly, uh, data in space, you know, you can imagine space debris, all sorts of reasons that data in space is not necessarily as stable as it is down here on Earth. 
If you're looking for data in a particular location and that data has been corrupted, you're not going to get that data back. And so the way IPFS works, being able to actually look for a particular piece of content and being able to pull it from wherever it's available, you know, if it's been corrupted on nine out of 10 pieces of hardware, it'll pull it from the one where it isn't corrupted. Um, that is actually also much more efficient. And the third reason that IPFS is great for space um, is that it actually allows you to verify cryptographically that data has not been tampered with. So you can imagine any time even a pixel is changed um, on a particular piece of content, it's going to have a different content ID, which means if you are taking a satellite image and then you beam it down to Earth using IPFS, which is what we did in the demo mission, um, you are going to be able to tell because of the content ID that that, that satellite image was never tampered with. And you can imagine why that would be something that's extremely useful. For the same reason, this same technology is already being used, um, for example, to preserve war crimes evidence in Ukraine and uh, to cryptographically prove that that evidence wasn't tampered with. Being able to take that and apply it to things like satellite images is potentially extremely powerful. Yeah. So this is huge. Um, so You've seen in the news and the press about some of the conflicts going on, some of the asymmetric attempts to, say, spoof GPS signals. But the important part of what Marta is talking about is you can also, you can conceptualize spoofing, perhaps, geospatial or images if you can interrupt and get inside the system. So what we're really talking about is reducing the vulnerability of a digital attack surface. That might be in the context of the commercial issue, might be something as a national security uh, threat or competitor, but it's also important to, to realize what Marta and Filecoin really have is an advantage, and this is something we're looking at. They're not internet servers in space, but there are a lot of processors. However, space is a high radiation environment, and that radiation is pernicious when it comes to memory, digital memory systems. And therefore, having the ability to have a distributed file system means that if there is degradation, it's graceful degradation. And that really, again, mixing both the commercial and the national security side, graceful degradation is the definition of resilience, either resilience from commercial or, again, from the national security. These things are woven together, and uh, therefore, it is actually a very interesting field of study and exploration. Uh, can you build on that a little more? You know, we we're talking about the benefits here. I'd love to, if you could take a minute or two to explain the challenges of getting to this point. What hurdles did you have to overcome to make this happen? So in a discussion like this, I have to be careful about not to get too wonkish on the defense side. But let me just say that um, the developments that got us here have a lot to do with different offsets, right? So an offset strategy is uh, coming to some type of response to a competitor's uh, advantage that you cannot offset by traditional means. In the first instance, the first offset for the defense side was uh, the consideration under Eisenhower of nuclear weapons because the Russians had overmatch in terms of numbers in Europe. So those considered the first offset and how you do deterrence. The second offset really got into the context of digitization, right? And actually moving towards uh, putting computers and things uh, inside and embedded in our systems. The third offset becomes something much closer to a combined arms effect, where you get different systems to work together. You get ISR and you get precision. From our point of view, we're really trying to figure out the fourth offset. And almost certainly, the fourth offset has a lot to do with the technology that's being innovated in foundation, as well as in the commercial side, and with a lot of people who are looking at this from fresh perspectives. That fourth offset is everything between education uh, and getting skills up, to in fact trying to figure out how you get that hybrid, hive organization, graceful degradation of systems, many of which weren't designed to work together. They weren't bought that way, they weren't launched that way, but you actually create what is a translation layer through software, and you create an operating system that gives you deep resilience. This is very relevant to our entire economy. It is also relevant to what we have to do, from my perspective, on the national security side. Sarah because there are many space nerds in this room. I would be remiss if we didn't ask you a little bit more about your mission. Maybe you could tell us a story or two about your experience going into space. 
Um, so my mission, I got selected as part of a citizen ASTRAP program, and it was the only program that selects astronauts that is not part of a government. So usually you're used to having NASA select astronauts or ESA or any space agency. But because in Egypt we don't have a human space flight program, we do have a space agency but doesn't have that, um, that was the only program, program that I could apply to. And I applied and I got selected. And um, it was, um, and then I, well, it was a crazy journey. And then, so the whole point of the mission was to analyze something called the overview effect, which is there's a lot of astronauts that go to space and they'll talk about the change of perspective that they get when they see Earth from space. So um, the whole point of the mission was to analyze that. And you sign a one-year contract afterwards and there's a, there's a whole process for it. And um, as an engineer, I was very skeptical as to how much that would actually influence one, you know? And also because most astronauts that go to space and have talked about the Oroviect have spent a long, long duration, so months. Um, and I knew that my mission was shorter. So for me that I was even more skeptical was to think like, okay, like how much is it really gonna influence me? And honestly, it was a lot more profound than I ever thought it could be. It really does change your perspective on the world. And it's really very much eye-opening both towards like our responsibility towards Earth and our responsibility towards humanity, um, our place in the world, our just how small we are, our connection with the universe, like why we do what we do, why are we exploring, why are we all in the space field, why do we have this innate, you know, need to be able to understand, to have those understandings, like we have, we all have these questions and that's for me personally, that's what got me into the space field. It's just about having, you know, needing an answer to those questions. And it still drives me crazy that I might die before having those answers. But you just have to kind of like move past that and just not let that stop you. So that's how it started for me. And it was really this overview effect was, you know, you hear it all the time. And honestly, like I've seen a lot of pictures about like of Earth from space. So you would think you'd be saturated and you'd think, oh, but I've seen it before, you know, like it's not, nothing special. But it's just like when you're taking a picture of a landscape, it never really does it justice because you don't really see it in 3D. The, eye, like the, 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 the colors reflect differently in your eyes. Your eyes absorb colors very differently. And when you see the movement of Earth, you see it moving, you see how bright it is. You see when the light hits you from Earth, when that's the light that's coming, and then you realize all of that. It took me a while after I came back to be able to put it into words to really understand why I was feeling a certain way, because everything felt so weird. It almost broke my reality and my understanding of everything, which sounds crazy or scary, but it really, really, truly did. And honestly, the scale of everything has changed. The way you, your relationship with fear has changed. Your relationship with Earth changes. Relationship with humanity changes. And really now, I've, since coming back, I've gotten more involved in sustainability projects or human rights issues. My mom's Lebanese, so it's something that's very close to my heart as well. So it's really something that, you know, you stop saying that I've always believed all my life that we can't really expect someone else to do things. We can't just say like, oh no, someone is better, like they're gonna do it and, or expect, you know, others to, to do things that you think you're seeing is wrong. So I've always tried to take responsibility, but now I'm seeing myself take bigger risks and be a little bit less scared and gotten involved in things that I didn't think I would get involved in before going to space. I'm an engineer, so for me this is, engineering is my comfort. Um, I founded like so different, you know, businesses throughout my, like, so it's also business, it's another language that you speak and it's, you know, communicating ideas and things like this. This is also like, you learn it, but then politics is a whole other language that you have to learn. So it's like you're relearning everything. How do you, how do you deal with everything? And then I really noticed that law and policy are the ways for things to be able to move forward. So engineering is beautiful, but for me that's comfortable because you have the data you have, you know, you can work on it. But then without policy, it really can't move forward. So that's why I've gotten more involved with that too. And then other, like, other things as well. Well, I think that was really inspirational. And I think we're all thinking, how do we sign up? <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to thank our panelists. Thank you for this. Congratulations, Marta. Congratulations to the Lockheed Martin team. Uh, this was a big move for uh, both organizations. And thanks, everybody, for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you.